Okay, thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, last class of the University of Atlanta and Known World Science Symposium. Um, again, we are recording, so if you do not want to be recorded, please um, turn off your, your video feed and use the uh, chat function rather than, than using voice. So I want to start off with a brief definition. Uh, during the Middle Ages, uh, science was a little bit different than when we think of it now. Uh, there was a lot more um, integration between disciplines. Uh, there was a heavy influence or um, impulse to create a more holistic viewpoint of the cosmos. And um, Aristotle laid it out as scientia uh, being any really robust form of um, of knowledge where you've laid out a logical presentation of why things behave the way they do. So not the current scientific method of testing and looking at results, uh, but rather a logical presentation, if you will, of, of the knowledge would have fallen under Scientia. And this is a, a depiction from the Ordus Delicarum, um, which we'll be looking at a little bit more in depth later. Um, this is philosophy and the seven liberal arts. And here in the center, we have a depiction of the Holy Spirit inspiring philosophy, who then in turn is breastfeeding out wisdom to the other liberal arts. And uh, so, so Harad has really uh, copied a lot of other viewpoints here with, with this depiction, um, this very common depiction. Um, she's included Socrates and Plato in the center. But then at the bottom, they've excluded these other poets and magicians that were outside of the realm of the influence of, of the Holy Spirit. So theology was very much in, ingrained in a lot of these, um, these liberal arts. Uh, and uh, during, especially during the time period we'll be looking at today, education was really seen as an essential part of salvation. So again, this focus on this class is the high middle ages, specifically the 12th century medieval renaissance. And for those of you that aren't familiar, there were three main renaissances of the Middle Ages. And starting with the Carolingian um, uh, Renaissance with Charlemagne and Otto, where you start getting these Renaissance Abbey schools and you have a rapid growth of monastic life um, where people could go for both men and women and, and have the opportunity to learn. Uh, in the 12th century, we have another renaissance with the, um, the popularity of translation centers, which were bringing in new texts or old texts, as the case may be. And I have a, a quick poll for you guys. Let's see. Okay. If you guys can see the poll, just go ahead and interact with it here. I'd like to know who your, your favorite 12th century uh, scholar or celebrity was. So we have some women that'll be covered here today and some women that are outside the scope of this class. We have 80%. I think that's a pretty good response rate. So it looks like Hildegard won, which is not really a surprise considering she's one of the focuses today. All right, so these translation centers, uh, they're really preserving and continuing knowledge that, that goes all the way back to Egyptian and, and Greek and, and Roman um, medical knowledge in particular. Um, and this was expanded on um, in the Middle East and Persia and Syria and, and uh, in the Arabic Catholics. And so what would happen is uh, these, these Greco um, and uh, Latin texts would, were being translated into Arabic around the time that they started falling out of favor on the continent. So those texts were preserved, and then they were around the 12th century, they were being translated back into Latin, along with these, these other texts by really key figures, um, such as even seen as canon of medicine, who is seen as one of the main fathers of, of modern medicine. So you have Toledo, um, there's the Abbey Library, Mono Cassino, um, and the School of Salerno, which are really key entry points back into continental Europe. 
Um, Constantine the African is another famous figure you might come across for translators. He was a Benedictine monk from Carthage and went across um, over to Salerno at the end of the 11th century and um, returned, if you will, um, some of these anatomical studies from Galen's time in Alexandria. So that was one of his main contributions to uh, this renaissance of learning. So what were, what were the opportunities for women? I, I mentioned that these Renaissance abbeys provided opportunities to both men and women. Um, there were also medical schools and court life where, where troubadours and, and poets could, be, could, could still be educated and, and, um, and, and explore that knowledge. So the main two here that I'm going over are the, the, the medical schools and the abbeys. Um, the medical schools did have, a there was a tradition of women treating women um, beyond, um, beyond uh, OBGYN. And so uh, also during this time period, doctors in Italy and elsewhere just started kind of outsourcing a lot of their, their medical care of people. Um, you know, the nurses started becoming more popular, barbers for surgery, apothecaries for medicine. You see this diversification of care. Um, a lot of the other universities outside of Italy were um, structured by canon law and, and uh, therefore excluded women. And we see an increased exclusion of women as we get uh, past the 12th century. Um, the abbeys at this time were uh, where the, the scholarly work was happening were following the Benedictine tradition. And they offered an escape from politics or marriage or a remarriage. And so you have these concentrations of scholars and physicians and scribes in these areas. And uh, the rule of St. Benedict actually had this mandate that you had to care for the sick as a moral obligation. So all these scholars were also, well, not all, but the majority were also functioning as physicians to, to people. Um, and it was actually considered to be a sin if you were to harm your patient. It didn't matter if it was ignorance or negligence, it was considered sinful to, to, um, to hurt someone. And um, the health of the soul was also included in this, in this more holistic approach. And of, of course, this would have diff been different than the, um, the training that, that they would have received at uh, the University of, say, Salerno. And uh, so Salerno, um, there's a, um, a legend that it was formed with um, someone who is Greek and Latin and, and Jewish and Arabic medical practitioners all came together to form this school. So kind of a Hogwarts type uh, rep. I don't know if this is where she got it or not, but it's that kind of a, a story. Uh, and they had this golden period in the, in the high middle ages with both male and female students and professors. Um, several major texts came out of there, um, including the um, Salerno Regimen and the Tertulla texts. Uh, and there was a standard curriculum, three years of logic before you even got to, to, to uh, study medicine. And of course, there's regional variation. Um, there's, uh, if you go over to the Iberian Peninsula, there's a, a tradition of, um, of women being trained again so that they could uh, take care of other women. A lot of Jewish women were trained this, in this way. Uh, and uh, in Germany, we also see that certain areas were seen as a purview of women, including kind of surprisingly to me, um, ophthalmology which was a, a newer um, import, if you will, into this time period. So ophthalmology, ophthalmology surgery, OBGYN, uh, were considered um, a women's, women's areas. So to get back to these abbeys, um, there's some pretty big polymaths active around this time, writing on, on diseases and cures, cosmology, astronomy, orology, which is the study of time. Um, as well as Physica, the world around them. So these abbeys, uh, in addition to being centers of learning and healing, as I mentioned, they're also political sanctuaries. So um, Kild Kildare Abbey in Ireland was unfortunately being destroyed around the 12th century, um, but they were very famous for their teachings of metalwork and illumination. Um, Clements of Barking Abbey was a poet translator. Uh, Barking Abbey would be the site of uh, where a lot of royals would, children would go to be tutored and, and learn. Um, Clooney Abbey was, has a, a pretty famous library. They were also the, the site of uh, some of these reform movements, particularly, I think it was August, Augustine um, around this time period. 
So the political uh, refugees might look a little familiar. We have uh, Matilda of Anjou, who was the heir to Henry I. Um, she became an abbess. Um, of course, Queen Eleanor of Aquitaine, she spent um, quite a few years at, at the same abbey later on, uh, about 50 years later, as I recall. Um, Princess Anna Comina in Byzantine um, areas, she, she went to a monastery as a, as a political, um, uh, as, as a result of her political machinations. Um, Eloise, she actually uh, uh, kind of didn't have much of a choice in going back to the abbeys. Um, we'll, we'll get to her in Abelard a little bit later. She actually reached, reached the, link, the uh, rank of equivalent of a bishop um, within, within the Catholic Church. Um, the prioress Christina of, of uh, Marquette um, was, had entered a, a hermitage to avoid marriage. And she has kind of a, a, a funny full longer story that I can't remember all the details of, but she's a fun one to look up if you wanna see um, people not responding well to, uh, to suitors. And I have a, a second poll here for you. And this one's just a single question. So on the recording, since you can't see the polling, the, the question is whose sister Mary was, was made abbess of Barking Abbey after his murder? And the hint is, is that some scholars think that she may also have been um, the author Marie de France. All right, we're at almost 70%. It looks like we have a clear consensus with Thomas Beckett, which is correct. So, so Mary Beckett wasn't a victim of political machinations that sent her to an abbey, but um, it, was, it was given to her as a recompense for her brother's murder. Okay, so Anna Comina, which I, which I mentioned, um, was a princess. She was the daughter of Emperor, Emperor Alexis. Um, she did most of her medical writing before she entered the abbey and wrote on um, psychosomatic disease, the, specifically the connection between envy and gangrene. Um, she became an administrator of the hospital her father built and was a witness to the first crusade. Um, she got banished to the convent after trying to get the throne. Um, and she was there for 35 years and wrote the Alexiad, which was a, uh, while it wasn't a um, scientific treatise itself, it's a pretty big one in terms of, um, it's a firsthand account of the crusade and she documented the presence of, of women and children during that. So the big three, the abbesses, Hildegard, Eloise and Herod, um, all three of them were with, living within Benedictine communities. Um, these were autonomous with an emphasis on reading and stability and loyal, loyalty to your local community. Uh, so they had mo uh, monastic scriptoria that flourished um, up in, for, through the 9th and 12th centuries. And then you see this decline in the Benedictine communities uh, for various reasons, but we also have this rise of the Franciscans and Dominicans um, who had a more mendicant lifestyle and were able to minister to more urban settings. So these, the Benedictines were, were loyal and kind of cloistered in their own communities. And, and they were hugely popular and, and recruited a lot of people in the 12th century, um, but that, that did fade after the 12th century. Now these abbesses had full control over their communities, including the education, um, but often the pastoral care would be fulfilled by um, a a counterpart from these from dual communities, a monk or a priest, or um, one example is Volmar for Hildegard, and he's actually depicted in some of her her illuminations, and we'll see him a little bit later. Um, so we have this this uh, situation where the abbesses might start um, bumping up against the abbot of, the, of their corresponding community, and 
a pretty good example is with Hildegard who um, wanted to form her own community and Abbot Kuno did not want her to. So she went over his head to the archbishop and there was this whole thing where her body became paralyzed and it was seen as a sign from God that he wanted her to have her own community. And they didn't want her to split off because this would have meant a loss of, of income from, from people coming in following her reputation. So basically a typical power struggle. <laughs> So Eloise, so this is, many of you probably know Eloise, uh, Elo, Eloise and Abelard, I just combined their name. Um, so she was known for her letters with, with Peter Abelard. Um, she was sent to the convent to be educated and, and followed him as his instructor and they, and they um, secretly got married and she became pregnant. Um, but her uncle, she, she didn't have the approval of her uncles. So um, she went to the, the convent and Abelard got castrated. So, so she stayed at, at, the, uh, at the Abbey and worked as a physician, um, continued her correspondences. Um, she wrote on a, a wide variety of topics, um, philosophy and theology oriented mainly. Um, and she had very critical discussions of um, what values should be taken into account for marriage. Um, childbearing and as well as sex work. Um, and her main famous kind of book beyond the letters is this, this uh, um, 42 questions that revolve around theology. But she did also work as a physician um, at the Abbey. And, and if you'll remember, she reached the equivalent rank of a bishop. And one more poll here. See if you guys know your Abelard and Eloise. So the question is, what did Abelard and Eloise name their child? It's a pretty unusual name. All right, we're a little bit over 70%. So the answer is actually astrolabe. So it looks like six of you got it right. It's pretty good, part of the class. Okay, Hildegard, yay, Hildegard. So um, she's actually, received a uh, equivalent canonization with the doctor of the church now. Um, she was a mystic composer, abbess, and healer. And um, uh, she actually invented a unique language just for her, for her nuns. And there's some debate over the purpose of this. Some people think she just wanted some uh, rhyming words to put into her music. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of debate about why she did it. Um, her nuns would, would, could wear tiaras. Um, there's some depictions of those that I found from much later, so I didn't include it here because I wasn't exactly sure if that's uh, uh, an accurate depiction or not. Um, but they were, they were seen as a celebration of their celestial divinity. Uh, the illumination here, you can see that she's receiving visions. Um, and writing them on a wax tablet. And that's Volmar on the right, uh, scribing it for her. So she uh, had this emphasis on, um, on her vision. So receiving information um, and presenting it mainly to an external audience. Uh, it was also clearly for her nuns with, with the unique alphabet and, and language as well, but um, kind of this going outwards of, of this flow of information. Um, she wrote, she had a ton of texts. Um, the main, the first ones we'll look at are uh, compiled in the Risen Codex manuscript. Um, and then we'll get into her more medicinal and, and natural history type um, manuscripts later, which uh, she did later in life. So Abbas Arard, um, she's a little bit later than Hildegard. She was very highly educated. Um, she, uh, her, her big work that she's famous for is the Ordus Della Chiarum. And this has kind of the opposite flow of information. She, she combined an encyclopedia of knowledge to train her nuns. Um, 
this was during a period of reform when the Augustines were splitting off. There was an Augustine group splitting off within the Benedictines. Um, and they were focusing even more on cloistering and, and furthering their knowledge. Um, and she was critical in this text too, and, and in her letters, um, uh, wanting more pastoral care to you know reform in all of this. Um, when she when she started the Ordus, she didn't have any male oversight. Somebody else was abbess. She just kind of got to do her own thing for a little while till she be became an abbess. Um, it's written in both Latin and German, and was used to, to to instruct the nuns both in the language as well as the content. And um, there's a salvation history as well as um, the scientia breadth of knowledge. Uh, one of the main things that's in there is a computer's table, which were, were pretty popular at the time. Um, and that allowed them to, to figure out how to calculate festival days for um, a full cycle of over 500 years. Uh, we'll look at that later, it was just a little tiny chart. Uh, and she did did write on cosmos and man as micro, microcosm as, as the same as that Hildegard did. So this illumination here is a self-portrait from the Ortis. Uh, it's a, a smaller section of a larger image here. Um, and this is her wider community that she's addressing and providing this knowledge to. And there's a, a lovely little bit in a letter to the community that um, comparing herself to a bee of, of gathering all of this, this sacred knowledge and, and, and philosophy in, into a book, the, the Garden of Delights. And, um, and of course, since she's an abbey, this is all done in service um, uh, to the church. Um, so she did have her original works interspersed in there, and this was you know, her synthetic knowledge. Um, and she, but she also did poetry and music just like Hildegard did as well. But I love that she just, there's a depiction of the whole community here. So go back to Hildegard. Um, Sivius is one of those, those main first big um, texts based around her visions. Um, some people think that her visions may have been related to migraines based on some of the descriptions. Um, but it does, you know, to me, that doesn't really matter why. This is, this is what she did. Um, so there were 26 visions and 35 illuminations here. So middle of the 12th century. And this vision of the cosmos, um, it's been called the cosmic egg, but it's a very ionic representation. Um, it's typically the, the cosmos was seen in a more circular fashion. Uh, but you see in the center, we have the planets lined up. Um, East was oriented at the top with Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, et cetera, with the earth as a sphere in the center. And her descriptions of this vision are all very embedded and integrated with ideals of harmony and justice and interconnectedness. So now about 10 years later, her next text has a depiction of the cosmos in a more spherical fashion. And she basically says, I was wrong. I've been told it's, you know, so we have this step away from a very divine feminine depiction into more of the classical cosmos that was seen to be okay at the time. So this picture, this illumination um, is the second vision in, in another, another text, um, the Divinian, Divinorum Operum. I think I got that right. Um, so there's, there's only 10 visions in this one. Um, so again, it's revised to a wheel and this outer structure here is, um, corresponds to the breast of, of a visual representation of God's divine love. That's what Theophany is, as a, as, a, as a physical representation, basically. And the metaphoric complexity is really increased here. You don't see this kind of um, more what you would expect to, to just see from a, a more secular viewpoint of the cosmos. It's, it's definitely gone a lot more metaphorical. And, um, and we have... Uh, man in the center here um, with different winds, the directions of the winds. And this is gonna be important um, uh, when you're looking at the, humor, the, the humors here, the humoral framework that she's operating in. This is, it's all integrated, it's all together. So to take a step back, the first vision in that work that has that, that 
theophany of divine love. So that cosmos would have been right in the center there for her, her metaphor. Down at the bottom, we have a new depiction of how she's getting her visions. And, um, and I love this, there's Volmar separated over here, working away as a scribe, and she's, she's writing down her, her visions um, on the wax tablet here. I, d I just love the, this little tiny, the little window coming out and the vision being passed down. So, so back to this image, this is actually the vision three. It's, it's focusing in on the center portion here. So uh, we've lost the, the larger divine love context and it's the man as the microcosm. And there's this direct correspondence between man and the cosmos. And so we have this um, interplay between bodily humor, humors and the air and winds. Um, there's a bunch of metaphors about kind of the way that veins and organs connect um, compared to the planet. Um, and it's all interspersed with biblical passages. She's uh, making sure that this isn't a secular representation. This is very much within her purview as an abbess receiving these holy visions. And this is in contrast to um, the man as microcosm that we see in um, the Ordus Delicarum from Harad. Uh, this is a very bad, in my opinion, copy <laughs> of, of the uh, what would have been the original illustration. We don't have the manuscript anymore. Um, it was, uh, um, was this one that was destroyed at, at the end of the 19th century um, during one of the wars. Um, so these are, these are, uh, what we have are copies that were made in the earlier 19th century. Um, so you can imagine that this probably would have been, you know, much fuller color and illuminated in more glory. Cause there, there are some that are more detailed, but it seems like they just, they took, uh, the time to copy the more religious illuminations a bit more detail than, than these more philosophical ones. Uh, but you can see there's, there are still some commonalities here between um, Hildegard and Herod's depictions. You have this kind of bizarre um, preservation of modesty of the man. He's making efforts to stand so you can't see his genitals. Um, um, you also have the representation of the elements, the humors. Um, she, Herod more explicitly parses out air, fire, um, earth and water here. And uh, so again, it's, it's the same kind of framework between them, but with in the Ordus Delicarum, we see this splitting out more of um, what is more religious and what is more secular knowledge. And I think that's probably a factor of her, um, her education versus Hildegard's. And also Hildegard had this uh, reputation for her visions and so she had, it was kind of required for her to present that in a certain manner. Um, and, and the key with, with both of these texts was that they uh, wanted to, to train the nuns to find these remnants of, of the holy in, in, in the world outside. Um, there was a lot of correspondence between the elements and um, like the four evangel evangelists, um, et cetera. It, it was, it was, an extensive metaphor during this time period, and it was not unique to these these um, to these manuscripts. Um, the Ordus has a depiction here on the bottom left of the planetary diagram. So um, rather than be embedded um, over, you know, a larger, um, uh, more iconographic depiction that you saw with Hildegard, it's 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 presented separately as more of a a scientia type presentation. Um, so that's on the left. And then in the center, we have um, a uh, depiction of more of that microcosm connection between man and the humors um, and split out. If you can read it, it's, it's got the air and water and earth and, and fire in there. Um, so, so again, Harad is kind of splitting the, these out a little bit more than um, Hildegard's integrative approach. Okay. And these computer tables that I mentioned earlier, um, 532 years distilled down to a couple of tables. And it's based on a 19 year lunar cycle and um, as well as a, a solar cycle in there. 
and uh, determines the dates of Easter relative to the full moon after the equinox, et cetera. And it's key to uh, remember that um, they don't have a consistent measurement of time during this, this time period. The mechanical clock didn't show up till the 1300s. Uh, now these, these computer tables were popular in different formats during this time period, but with, with hers, she even distills it down even further into this, um, this grid down at the bottom. So that grid, um, encompasses the information on, in, the, in the top two. And she thought this was very important for her nuns to have that knowledge, to be able to compute it themselves. And she even went a step farther and translated this computation of time into a hexam hexameter verse. It had to do with the number of letters combined to, to calculate the next thing. And so very complex metaphors and, and learning and, and pedagogy approaches here that are, are pre present in this manuscript. So now Hildegard's medicine and natural history is probably more along the lines of what you thought you'd be getting this full time period. Uh, but I did want to uh, share that broader view of the cosmos, because uh, I think it's important to know where these women uh, were coming from and, and what their perspectives are about what even constituted scientia and, and larger knowledge. So we're going to step into the humors a little bit here. Uh, another poll for you guys. So this depiction here um, has, it's a woodcut, so 15th century, way later than our time period, but it does a really nice job of kind of distilling down to um, the humors as related to different personality types. Uh, we have the, the um, phlegmatics uh, playing their instruments and generally being a little bit lazy. Um, we have the sanguine, hot-blooded lovers, um, the melancholy, kind of uh, sedate, quiet artisans down at the bottom left. And then we have the caloric depictions, which tend not to be very positive. Um, and it's, it's a man beating his wife. So I'm curious to know if you guys know your Hogwarts house, because that is very much a modern correspondence of the humor, humors. Um, and then also what that corresponds to um, with the humoral temperament as based in, in, with these names. And then, of course, we have these four archetypes that have really taken over TV shows. We have um, Golden Girls, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Seinfeld, Avatar, Scooby-Doo, uh, Sex and the City, where they have distilled down these tropes that, that you can still map down to these humoral temperaments. And these humors, you know, they, they go beyond just temperament. It has to do with your overall health. And that's what, what Hildegard is, is mainly focused with. So we have a few more people still voting here. For some reason, it's not allowing me to submit. I select an answer for both of them, but I can't submit it. Uh, there's a third question down at the bottom. Oh, maybe that's what's keeping it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't notice it. Scroll down. Sorry. Yeah, it's a long pull. <laughs> I thought this would be good at the end of the day, though. Get us a little before we wrap up here. All right, we're about 68%, so that's pretty pretty good. A few more coming in, 77%, okay. So we'll share those results now with you. So we have a lot of Ravenclaws, so stereotypically speaking, Ravenclaws and, and melancholics are interested in, in learning, and uh, so that follows. and. Of course, and the Golden Girls are the most popular, so. All right. So moving on, um, humoral balance. Again, you have this combination of warmth and wetness. So the phlegmatic is cold and wet. Sanguine is hot and wet. Caloric is hot and dry. Melancholic is cold and dry. Um, and those all also interact with the elements, the, the air, earth, fire, and water. And then you also have this correspondence with bodily fluids, blood, phlegm yellow bile and black bile. So with it, multiple layers of this metaphor, it just really expands over the whole framework. And um, especially when you're looking at the way that the humoral framework is used down in Salerno, you have a huge impact of natural causes on illness versus the spiritual. Um, when you're in the abbeys, you have this uh, um, pointing to original sin as as the cause of, of all illness and, and why we have good plants and bad plants is because of original sin and um, 
even labor pains, et cetera. And, but regardless of which viewpoint you take on how the spiritual may interact with the humors, um, this disturbance uh, of the humors can come in from food or drink or some change in the environment. And um, they all emphasize actually observing your patient. So that's a huge step forward. Um, of course, bloodletting is one of the more negative things to come out of it. There's, I think, only maybe one condition that would actually benefit from bloodletting when you have um, too much iron in your blood. Um, but bloodletting continued throughout the 19th century. So, so there's, there's some, they had, they had a clue on some stuff, right? They were observing and testing and seeing what worked, but then they were very mistaken on some other approaches. I think that's important to keep in mind for, for all of these. Um, Hildegard had a, uh, uh, um, an interesting approach to balancing the humors. So, so the approach, again, the ideal is to balance all of these. You don't want to go too far to any extreme. Um, she, she saw the, the greening, this um, veritas, uh, ver, sorry, I'm losing my words. <laughs> so bear with me. Uh, the, this greenness out there, the little life force, could be used to, to balance the humors. And um, since animals didn't have souls, according to them at the time, um, this essence is what, what animated them and gave them that life. And we could, we could ingest it and balance our humors. So through animals and plants. And, um, and she has this lovely quote about um, you know, all, this, all this brilliance and beauty coming from God and um, and all of these gods are, are all of these creatures are, are beautiful and have radiance. Otherwise, it wouldn't be created. Um, and this illumination is is again from that same text we were looking at earlier. You can see kind of the, the commonalities in the border and everything, and um, this split of the seasons and tending to um, tending to the plants. So this is often referred to as uh, the, as a cos as the cosmic tree. But again, you have this interplay of, of these winds, the air element coming in and influencing um, the humors of, of, the, of the planet, the people, and, and the animals. So the, the two main books um, were sometimes um, combined into, into one, uh, but they were also split out into Physica and Cause and Cure. The Physica has uh, its functions more of an index for different elements. You could look up different things and see what their um, humoral properties were. If they're hot or cold, what could, you could use them to treat. Um, and then cause and cure is kind of the rever uh, inverse of that. Um, there's a, a presentation of, of the cosmos and the order of the world and where diseases are coming from. But then she goes into specific remedies for, for each of these. So you have a, a listing of of conditions and then how to treat it. So they're they're coming at things from the opposite opposite ends. Um, and we, of course, we do see this disbalance in treatment referenced down in Salerno and Trata. Um, uh, again, this is where we get the women being hot and men being cold. I mean, she didn't start it, but that was the the general consensus. Um, I'm sorry. Some women are hot. Some women are cold. Um, so we all have our, our own relative um, set points. And there was this expanded into different latitudes, um, different fabrics, linen versus wool, et cetera. So some, some of them you know, are a little bit more make sense. You know, wool being hot is, you know, that's, that's relatively direct and linen being cooler. Um, but the idea was was to take the opposites to cure each other. So so if um, if uh, some woman is too hot, then you would want to cool her down um, with fumigation of, of various things. And this gets into Lady Issa's area. <laughs> we'll, we'll, and the ladies of Salerno classes earlier today. So we'll leave that there. Um, but Hildegard's Physica has a, a lot of these same um, approaches. Uh, again, she does intersperse her religious um, context um, into some of this. But um, uh, so the, again, the ca cause and cure, um, the original sin is the origin of, the, of disease, but still this humoral context. Um, it talks about menstrual cycles rel relative to the lunar cycle. So that there's a, a lot of things in here that I didn't really expect to see. Um, she addresses infertility as both a male and female issue. 
Uh, she even talks about health of animals. And then there's a, there's a whole last book on um, the influence of the moon uh, based on the, the day of the month you were born and, and so forth. This was all seen as, as an integral approach to, to medical treatment. Um, and again, this is written in both German and Latin um, and uh, still carrying on Hildegard's philosophies, um, but with this emphasize connecting to this humoral framework of the importance of hygiene and diet to, to correct these um, imbalances. So I have one example here from Cause and Cure um, for treating a kidney stone. Um, she's basically saying, distill some bile salts, add some, um, add some sassafrage to it and, and put it together. And I thought, well, does she really mean for kidney stones? Because from my own knowledge, you know, that bile salts are usually associated with treating a gallstone. Well, no. <laughs> So there, so this is a, a recent, well, relatively recent um, uh, primary literature testing um, the uh, inhibition of kidney stones by using bile salts as treatment. And it, um, there, at least according to this study, does seem to be um, somewhat effective. So, so some of these treatments have been verified with, with um, current scientific testing. Obviously, not everything's going to be um, up to snuff. <laughs> um, now this is uh, going over to Physica. So here things are listed out um, by their their category. Um, this example here is radish in uh, under plants. Um, so radishes were considered more hot than cold. She lists out a very um, kind of detailed way of of preparing. Uh, with, with honey and wine, adding the radish powder to it. Um, it's thought that eating it expels a person's evil humors. Um, and then you should eat gal and gal afterwards. So that gal and gal is very similar to ginger um, because of the stench of the, the breath after eating radishes. So if any of you have had radishes, you probably understand that. So th this, um, this slide here is, uh, Excuse me, just a moment. Let's see. Sorry about that. So these um, these references here are all related to radish uh, medicinal potential. So again, there are some things here that are, are being investigated and backed up by modern science, but clearly not everything. Uh, this one here is for the use of diamonds. And I like this one because um, she says that anybody who's a liar or frenetic or wrathful should just always keep a diamond in their mouth. And I thought, well, they're not eating it. Uh, they're just keeping it in their mouth. And that probably means they can't talk. <laughs> So, so there's some, there's some funny stuff in here. Um, uh, Physica, I, I like just opening it, uh, the translation and, and reading some passages here and there. Um, uh, unicorn is another one. So obviously there's not going to be any unicorns, um, around, but she has a whole process here for how you should pulverize the liver and, um, process it into an ointment and then lead. Is, is another one um, that uh, she does a comparison between a dead person and a living person that, that because this um, keeps a dead person from swelling up, you shouldn't use it on a live person because it would kill them. So there is some observations there that lead is uh, harmful um, and that you shouldn't drink from a lead vessel, but because of lead being cold, not because lead is, as we know, poisonous. So they, so they made the same observations for some things, but had a different framework and understanding for, for a lot of this knowledge. Um, and then just as a, as a bonus here, I included St. John's wort because um, a lot of modern herbal medicine uses, uh, will address St. John's wort for its medicinal properties. But it's clear that Hildegard is not using um, St. John's wort in, in her medicinal cabinet at this period of time. It's, it must have come along later. Um, she says it's uh, not used much because it's 
small uncultivated and the neglected herb. So we have one time point that it's not being used in the 12th century, if you're interested in tracking the, the usage down. So I have just uh, another couple slides to wrap up here. Um, I went through Physica pretty fast. So after we're done, if anybody wants to go back and, and read those slides a bit slower, I'm happy to do so. So the, the legacy of these women, unfortunately, um, has to do with challenges to their authorship. Um, you know, modifications are lost, they're copied, they're modified over time. Um, the Ortis, as I mentioned earlier, was destroyed um, 1870. Uh, they did a major reconstruction of it um, just a few decades ago. Unfortunately, get, getting your hands on the copy of that is a little pricey. So relying, um, we're relying on uh, other people's analyses of a copy of the manuscript. Um, and the manuscript itself was acknowledged to be a compilation. It's an, it's an encyclopedia. It's her synthesis, synthesis of, her, of her knowledge. Uh, but she does have original passages in there. Uh, Hildegard's main criticism has to do uh, with that uh, she collaborated with scribes. So the question was raised, well, did she, did she really think of all these things? Was this really coming from her and her visions or did her scribes step in and, and collaborate there? Um, Anna Kamina is kind of a fun one. Her uh, lack of reference to her own gender was, was seen as proof that she couldn't have written the Alexiad, um, that it was based on her husband's field notes. But then the writing style itself was also ascribed to her gender. So you had the same argument being both ways, uh, used both ways for her uh, authorship. Um, Eloise had her own critics being uh, claimed that they were romanticism. It was anachronistic. She couldn't possibly be thinking these things in the 12th century. Um, and the, the recent controversies go back to early 19th century and have been repeatedly disproven uh, by comparison of, of different letters and, and works that were, were, were directly verified. Uh, but it keeps, it keeps popping up. Um, one of the more recent uh, papers uh, with raising this point um, points to this verification of, sor of sources in and of itself as an important uh, development within history uh, as a discipline. And, in, the, in modern times. So not so much that the controversy was wrong, but that the methods used to disprove the controversy were important. Um, Trotto of Salerno had uh, um, her, her larger Tratula text uh, was a compilation of three books. And, um, but there were two others that were more directly described to a Trotto of Salerno. And uh, by comparison to these, these other books, um, Monica Green, who did a, a pretty well-known translation of the Tratula um, determined that uh, the treatments for women text out of the out of the three in the Tratula was the one that was most likely to have been directly written by Trata herself or coming out of the, the female uh, professors of Salerno at the time. So basically uh, kind of a consistent, um, more modern doubt of the authorship based, based on pretty much gender alone. So here's my contact information. If you have any questions, um, I'm happy to answer them. I will put a link to the slides in the chat. Um, I do have a references slide after this. And um, let's see here. So there's the slides. And the reference list also is a little bit more extensive slightly on the on the handout. So there's 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 the ones that were uh, the most useful to me during this. The direct translations um, obviously are are going to be a, a little bit more reliable. Um, these are these are modern translations. Um, so the potential for uh, Victorian overlays, I think is a little bit less um, than, than if the translation was, was older. Uh, and there's 
there's a bit more um, investigation into the larger context in some of these other books, um, particularly The Garden of Delights. Uh, that, that's a pretty pricey book. Uh, but if you guys have, have seen um, scribed.com, uh, they have a free 30 day membership that you can sign up for to read some of these texts. If uh, you're interested in checking them out, that's how I uh, got into them to, uh, to develop the class because they're basically like a textbook and all the pricing that goes along with that. So I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. We are, um, I know it's late in the day and it's dinner time, but I'm happy to hang out for anybody that, that has, uh, has questions or thoughts. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>